Awesome. We're ready to go? All you. Okay. Well, again, um, thank you very much. Where is it? He left. Here he's gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, get and run. Should I text yeah. them? Get and run. <laughs> thank you, Marcella, for your dear Facebook. Thank you, Marcella. You'll see it on Twitter on the way home. Um, I was over there airbrushing his clothes off him while he was presenting. How's it going so far, Good. I usually like to get real present with the crowd. It freaks you guys out and it puts me real comfortable. So that was yeah. one time. Um, it's better than picturing you guys naked because then I go home with it. And I, already have, I already have those pictures in the car and that's, that's fine. Um, so what I'm going to talk about tonight is um, kind of an organization and more approach to Revit. The, um, on the Los Angeles Revit user group blog, are all of our handouts are we're actually I made these guys actually create handouts for these presentations so these are more like full-fledged um, courses um, although we're not doing the full course for you we're just kind of talking about it you can go and download mine's I don't know 10 or 15 pages and Troy's is however long it is and when Marcelo does his it will be probably anywhere from one page to 40 probably more like a 40 page Clarify the what Marcelo just did. There's not a handout. Yes, and uh, thank you. Yes, like I said uh, beforehand, what we just saw from Marcelo, you will not find documented until he actually does a class on that. Because though that was um, one family, the adaptive component, um, he is working on multiple. Where's Where's Stop my moving around so much? Where is my um, limit? The window to the window. From there. Yeah. So I'm good over here. Okay, I'm just trying to get away from the. So, um, what, and it would be awesome to not, you know, keep being more about it. <laughs> what Marcelo did was special for you guys. And like I said, it's going to be clipped off the video tomorrow. So whoever's lucky enough to have seen that before whatever course he teaches that at, um, that was very special. Um, so, what I'm going to talk about more is browser organization and organizing your file. And how I'm going to start it off is a little bit, oh, I should have been flying through these. There you go. Essentially Revit. Now, the Essentially Revit, why is this not, there we go. I think I copied this stuff on top of itself. Essentially Revit is not Revit 101 necessarily, but it is, um, more things that we have isolated in these next three months are going to be, not everything, but at least a good start on things that need to be dealt with in Revit. And quite often, a lot of the stuff we deal with are just real bare bones, must be done every time or else you can expect a nightmare project. Um, and one of them is the organization of a project. Now, the first thing that I bring up here is to BIM with integrity, using BIM as an adjective? No, it's an action word, um, as a verb. Don't say BIM model. Fluffy kittens die every time you do. So even though I just said it, yes, a kitten somewhere just died. Don't say ATM machine, yes? Are we all agreed? That's a little bit silly. It's an automated teller machine. It's not an automated teller machine machine. It's not a building information model model. It's a building information model, period. Right? Yeah. So when anybody speaks about it and says a BIM model, they've either just made a little bit of an error in English syntax, or they may not know exactly how they're talking, what they're talking about to a level where they've made that distinction. And I, we think that very strongly that distinction needs to be made. We need to know what we're talking about. And BIM with integrity means at the project level, at the user level, before starting a project, if the team does not follow the protocols and the processes, you can be guaranteed your project will be a debacle. Guaranteed that it will be a nightmare to work in if people aren't using silly enough things as the same naming convention, right? Horrid. I mean, you can get really, really bad results. And I do warn you, another warning. 
If you actually organize your project and hold to it, you can expect success. So be forewarned. Hold to your organization and you can find success. Has anybody ever gone into their project file, and their actual file with papers and stuff in there, and found things misfiled? Or not found things because they are misfiled? How awesome is that? Right? Every hour is a couple hundred dollars just flushed down the toilet. We don't want that. We want to develop these uh, protocols and actually follow them. So the browser organization is the first in the line of these. And we're not going to talk about families. That's for another time. That could be a whole several hour ordeal. But we're going to organize, talking about organizing views and sheets, right, for just these logical systems. Um, there's a little workflow that I go through. And I'm just going to fly through these, and some of these, you know, you're not going to be able to catch all the words, so it's not a big deal. I'm going to switch over to the actual PDF that you can download and show you all of this stuff. But um, it goes into the how to create a view and all of the different things to do. You know, harps on this, always say yes to that. Why? Because I've done so many projects, and every project where people say no to that, it becomes a nightmare down the line, and views get physically lost. We don't want that. We want things to be organized and um, predictable. So if somebody new comes onto a team, we can actually give them the documentation. They can read how it's been set up, trust that it's been set up that way, and actually work on the project, as opposed to getting in and going, why are all these names different? I don't, just We don't want low-value tasks taking away high-value money. right? So that's what this is all about. And there happens to be these three different parameters that we set up. And you see, it's just there's heading one and heading two. I don't know how much more simple that could be. We know heading one is always the top level. Heading two would be below it, if you've ever used anything like Microsoft Word or whatnot. Um, and then it's by family and type. So we can get these organizations where we only have to see a very limited amount of views. There in a project are going to be hundreds, if not thousands, of views. I do not want a linear list at all. I don't want to go fishing through there. I want to go into a little little bitty subgroup. And these are some of the things, and again, I'm going to fly through this because we'll look at this in the PDF about what these um, headings are going to be. Now, in Revit 2013, there is um, the developers, one of those gifts that Marcella talks about, one of those gifts has been given to the rest of us, the MEP and the architecture Revit tours. Um, Revit Structure has had this for quite a while now, but we are now with the one box, we are all able to get all, um, we're all able to get this, where we can now have view types. So for plan views, you can make new plan view types, and very quickly, you see over here I have different plan view types, they're both four plans, but just like elevations had interior and exterior as a breakup, well now plan views can have those breakups, and you can come up with these on the fly as much as you want. Yes? Why does special or ignorant, you could do that in previous versions? Go try it in 2011. I did it this morning. In architecture? Not on my, not on my 2011. So, you might be. You might be. You sure you weren't using structure? Because I like to, I, yeah, tested that again uh, last week and the week before. So, yeah. Yeah. So, you, we'll have to talk after. And I, I'd like to see that proof of concept. No, I, I that would be I would love to see how your thing is set up to where that happened because absolutely didn't happen to me or anybody I've ever known in older versions. So yeah, well, let's bring your computer. Let's look. Regardless, if it was there, it is there now, and it's a really good uh, addition to being able to organize the view sheets. And why is it important? Again, pretty much because we want to be successful. I want to look like this kid. I mean, I don't want to look like the little infant. Um, <laughs> but I want to have that face and that attitude, right? That's what we want. That's what I want to give to my team. And it does take a little bit of, um, you know, I don't want to say policing, but it does take a little bit of policing. You have to be hammering on people to follow these conventions. One extra space in between words screws up this, the organization. Take your time. Make sure it's all spelled correctly and everything will be fine. Does we have the PDF up? Do you? OK. 
I'm just going to do it the old school way. Really? No, you no? have the wrong mouse. It's right there. It's the last button. This one? Yeah. What is it? F11? No. Yeah, you got rid of the toolbar. Yeah, I didn't want that. There's another one. You're not in Adobe, dude. We're not in Adobe. No. Okay, so where's Patriot? Oh, well, that's fine. I'll just sit over here and scroll. Oh, that was really awesome. Okay. Any change in your opinion on organization with the browser search and It's going all over the screen. What's that? Have you changed any of your opinion on browser organization with the uh, search in 2013? No. Yeah, no. Not so much. Um, oh, thank you. I, I just don't um, find that the search is, I don't want people just surfing around, searching. I want them to know where to go look, see a small list, go into there. Um, but again, it's just, that's just my kind of, you know, having come from Kind of setting up these organizations. I'm not going to change the organization now all of a sudden because a new version has a new functionality and revamp everybody. You know, everybody's into, you know, they're starting to work and everything's kind of worked out. New teams, you know, we might do something different next year, but, you know, um, they're still working on projects that span back 2011, 2012, and now they're starting projects, you know, doing projects in 2013. So to have two different workflows, Again, I want to be that little kid with that face. I don't want to be, well, remember you're in 2013, we have a new protocol, you know. So, haven't really changed all that much on this. So, this handout goes through all these things and it talks about, like I said, creating views and then the organization and it breaks it down. And it really goes through very granularly what these um, names are. I'm guessing we can get to width here. Let's do that. So the workflow for creating views that I try to be really hardcore about is this. You create a view, you name or rename the view, because the name has been generated generally, and then you change whatever parameters you need to change. You don't do anything else before you fix all three of those, period, ever. I don't have time. No, you absolutely have time. Because you're not going to remember what you did. You're going to create 20 views or three views or 100 views, and you're not going to have a good organization, and they're going to get all over the place. So this is really kind of tightly managed. Now, these in images on the right seem harmless enough. That happens to be several elevations on top of one another. Can anybody tell? No. I can't. Certainly. That's one that's on a sheet except there's others underneath it. So if you use, I love the duplicate views command. It's an awesome command. I've even done it on projects where I've duplicated my elevations and sections as dependents. Now, it can be really powerfully used, but if you don't know what you're doing and you duplicate as dependent your section views, you now have section markers on top of one another. You start putting those on the sheets, you don't see them. How fun is that? And then you get people redlining it. Where is my section? It's on the sheet. Where is it? And nobody knows. So there is a workflow that you can employ, but you do have to employ it and be mindful about it. So if you use the duplicate by dependent with anything other than plans, you do have to be careful and, and come up with a strategy. That's awesome, all those question marks. We don't want those. So this really talks about all of that. It talks about the would you like to rename the corresponding views. And the reason that we always say yes and how I can always say yes is, let me pop down here. Where is it? No, oh, well. Is that we have these things called – no, it's on the other thing. I'm not going to go into it. We have these things called um, – associated views. So when you create your level, right, that creates a plan view, unless it's like window head height, but all the main levels. Those are associated 
to the actual level datum object. I want that name to always be associated to it. I always want to be able to track and manage which those views are. Frankly, what I will do is I will use those views for project management. When they, oh, I just want to look at the model. Go into the associated views. They never go on the sheets, and they never go on the sheets. So you screw up whatever you want to screw up. And as long as the building doesn't explode, we're fine. Um, so we keep those kind of locked away, and we don't touch those. We have user views that are um, employed. There they are. So right, we have the system views, we have presentation views, all these others. Right, is this an exhaustive list? No, there could be more. And you see there's kind of, uh, it only goes up to six. But the user views, that's where we do the modeling from. The CD views, I fought for just the letter C. I don't like the extra letter. I don't need it. I know C stands for construction, right? This office really fought hard for the D. Uh, you know, I'm going to pick my battles. I let them win that one. I got some others. Um, so the CD views are the ones that are actually going to go onto a sheet. Those are the only views we annotated. Only views we annotated. Now I might annotate in my user view, hey Jay, don't forget to fix the furniture over here, something like that, but those are never going to go onto a sheet. So our workflow is never to annotate, don't dimension in your user view because it's not going to get to a sheet. Don't develop your user view enough to where you're like, wow. I should put this on a sheet, it's done. No, we don't do that. The user views are to model in, the other views are to actually put on the different sheets or to do certain tasks like the work coordinate, etc. Um, and then here's kind of a list of those, uh, the headings, what we will use. Uh, obviously 3D and ISOs, and with the naming conventions, we separate those all out. We'll get through here. The, uh, the triple X here is a person's <coughs> initials. In my office, when people say, well, I only have two initials, I say either use an underscore or an X. They say, can I use a Q? I say, no, you can use an X. <laughs> they usually go for the underscore, which is perfect, because it puts that amount of space in there. I want three letters all the time, because the other um, view names, as you'll see in a moment, generally have two letters other than RCP. we got to break the rules, right? Make a rule, you got to be able to break it. So generally, all of those other um, official views are with two-letter prefix. Pre pre prefixes? Are with two-letter prefixes. The user views, again, with those three initials, I can pick it out from across the room, as long as I have my glasses on. So this is kind of a, an example of the naming convention. Everybody sits down, they read this document one time, and we go, okay, everybody get that PR means presentation? Good, I don't need the word presentation. OA, anybody figure out what that stands for? It's on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Outside air, that would be nice, yes. No, I mean, it might, in this convention. Overall, right, so you get an OA, you know that's going to be an overall plan, show them the whole building. Pretty simple. But Jay, I hate these coded things. I mean, look at those names. I don't know what that means. I don't want that to be what's on the sheet. I can't have that, right? The VA will freak out at me. My client will go nuts if they see that on the view. Yes, so would my, my clients. In the project browser of Revit, in the project browser of Revit, these names that come up here are the the values under the parameter view name. Yes? That's the view name all day long. You see over there? View name, 3D. That's what this view is. Up at the top it says 3D. Yes, we know. You notice two parameters below 3D, what that says? Title on sheet. How many people didn't know that before this moment? Come on. Awesome. You guys are awesome. Or somebody's lying. <laughs> I didn't know. Troy, you didn't know? <laughs> no, we don't know. Well, that's okay, Troy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Troy, for being honest. I get a treat. You get a treat. Um, title on sheet. If something is put in there, that's what goes onto the sheet no matter what. Period. It, it just overrides the view name all day long. So in my template, 
I actually have the title on I have the whole cartoon set, some this basic cartoon set. You'll see at the end all of these um, view names have been cartooned out, and they all have their title on sheet. And if I go to my management schedule of the view list, and I see a view that's intended for a sheet, and it doesn't have a title on sheet, A, I know who to go talk to. B, I simply have to put something there, and then I'll be correct. So that's how we can get through with these coded words. Why do we like the coded, the small coding? Because I want to have the project browser up, and I want it to be small. There are other reasons, but that's pretty much the main one. So this goes through and just breaks down all of the different naming conventions that this is built on. Um, building sections, same kind of thing, right? BS, which I love to just say in public. Because um, they're in Revit, they kind of become BS views as well. Because the building and the workflow, my building sections really, for the most part, they get me my datum overall dimensions, and that's it. And the other thing they get are my wall sections and maybe a couple details called out. I don't deal with, I don't put insulation in the wall sections. If you do, good luck. You're going to do your project slower than me. We're going to make some profit. You're going to be fighting with insulation at a scale that is totally inappropriate to print it at. Um, so I don't see the need, uh, unless you're doing a tiny building. You know, if you're doing a building of any size, I think about 60 feet or bigger, um, building sections are much less uh, necessary. But they do get you to be able to cite the other views. So we go through all of the different naming, and that's pretty straightforward. And then we get down to the sheets. Sheets are done a very similar way. This naming convention that is in this, uh, what do you call that piece of paper? Handout. In this handout, is um, based on the national BIM standards, which are based on the national CAD standards. By the way, does anybody have in their mind a distinction between BIM and CAD? Nobody? CAD is too weak. Okay, so is that kind of how a lot of us hear that, right? CAD is like AutoCAD drafting 2D. Anybody else think that? Yeah, I see a couple heads shaking. Uh, that seems to be how the industry has it in their heads quite often. In fact, my blog is called Cad vs. Bim. Well, uh, a few months in, I was giving a presentation at, um, uh, for Mickey Mouse's crew, and um, they, in the middle of a presentation, by the way, don't have an enlightening moment in the middle of a presentation. It usually throws you off. But I had this kind of enlightening moment where I realized that CAD, C-A-D, simply means computer-aided design. BIM is CAD. It is a component of it. There's no difference. Once we dropped off that, the second D, the drafting D, it became computer-aided design. So it's OK now. Although our industry, we think of CAD as two-dimensional. But I diverge. So this is based on those CAD and BIM standards with one simple um, distinction in the numbering convention of the sheets in this set, I like to have the number right after like A4 point something or O4 point something. After the point, I want that to be the building level. Now that conven this convention, by the way, for everybody, if you want to adopt this, this convention works 100% perfectly for buildings up to and not exceeding nine stories. Why, Jay? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> because of the digits. Not enough digits. Then you got to start adding more digits. So up to nine stories, this works awesome. After nine stories, we make a little tweak, and then you have a new uh, convention. So. This one is built up to have the level name or the level number in the uh, convention. And these are you know, pretty straightforward. Uh, if anybody's seen an architectural set, there may be, oh, our set, the fours or the floor plans, or the, here are the, uh, the ones or the floor plans. I've done it. All twos are floor plans. Anybody else have other numbers? That's fine. They're just variants. It's the same kind of thing. I like, what I like about this organization is, it kind of starts with the low things with the lower numbers and the higher up things with the higher things. So 
you know, plans are usually the first and they're horizontal, so they're kind of first. So, and there's our friend again. Now, in the uh, appendices, there are all of the different prefixes that we use. Is this an exhaustive list again? No, it's not. There are others. But just briefly, right, we do distinguish between each kind of view possible. The demolitions and the existing, the 3D, these are the ones, right? You've got a rendering, camera view, or an isometric view. I want to know the difference between them. Just take an extra two seconds when you're naming the view, put this up front, everything will be awesome. We'll be able to find them, group them, and understand what's going on. Right? There's that OA thing again, and we have the overall, enlarged, and partial. And you see how partial over here is very specifically for the dependent views. So if you have anything other than a dependent view, it is never with a PT. Yes, it's just an abstraction, and it does it matter if it was different? No, but you got to go with something, so why reinvent the wheel every time? There's a list of these basic uh, types of floor plans that we use. The building sections, yes, there is a distinction between a detail section and a detail that is a drafted detail view. I want to know which one are coming live off the model, whether those model objects are shown or not. And I want to know which ones are specifically 2D. How would we time? 720. Okay. We're running up to it. Obviously, the elevations. The final, uh, pretty much, that I'll go into is the star management. I have schedules that go onto sheets. I have schedules that do not go onto sheets. Star MGMT up front, A, puts them up at the top of the list of schedules, and B, tells me I can mess with this and rearrange it all the time and it won't affect um, anything on the sheets. I'm going to say, Nick, that was, that's hilarious. I'm going to say last time in, in um, LA, I think you had turned off the lights. Or it was me, one of the two of us. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, make sure, hey, the lights just go off. Um, so the star management are schedules that I can go into, you can go into, and rearrange the data to actually manage it, right? View lists are important, sheet lists. Every one of the categories of families that you have, you're going to want to manage and make sure, do I have duplicate types? Why do I have all these things? So we have uh, schedules that are basically made just to do that management, and they don't go onto sheets. So here's that naming uh, strategy for sheets. The first letter is the discipline, right? A, architecture, S, structural, W for... MEP, which is, who cares? Um, right. No, we love you, MEP. Why would I put my sheets in your series anyways? <laughs> well, you don't put, that's a, that's a funny thing, so, right? So Troy said, why would I put my sheets in your set anyways? You wouldn't, I would. Exactly. I'm going to put your, um, so we right, in the drawing index. Yes. yes. So I'm going to, when I link in your file, so I need to, yeah. Um, so if you don't put a, an M there, or an E, or a P, we're going to have a conversation. So you need to tell me what to do. We would tell you what to do. Or we would have at our kickoff meeting that lovely conversation, and you say, cool, I'll do that. You do this. Everything will be good. Um, and then the next is the type, a subtype, the level, and then the sequence, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, ten. And we'll see in a second. So here's what those types and subtypes, right? The AOs are front sheets, and then Zero is the cover, one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Floor plans, I always know in this convention that the A11s are the regular floor plans. The one twos are always RCPs. Never are they different. Very straightforward, right? Why reinvent the wheel? The standards, you know, architects sat down and fought on these standards for years. Do we need to waste money on this? No, nah, not in my mind. So these are the other numbers that everything comes into play. Um, pretty straightforward. There's several different kinds of details. You see other details. That's so when you want to make a, you know, add things of your own, you can add them. CAD details. Awesome. CAD details would be a lovely one. And then here's basically just what the cartoon set in this project looks like. Uh, how I have it built up. It's for just a couple story building. Um, so these are all the sheets that everybody gets when they start a project. 
And instead of starting a project and having to build all of these to get to a cartoon set, day one on a project, whoever's managing the BIM basically takes this, starts the project, saves it, turns it into a central, and reduces into what they need. Now there's going to be some addition, but it's more reduction and removing stuff rather than adding everything. I don't want people to add things, especially since in the project, these are the titles on sheets. Remember, we have a really small code of um, view name for all of these. So that's already been defined. And then I have some leverage that if people aren't following the convention, all you have to do is sit them down with their boss in the room, put that project browser on the screen or the schedule that shows the view name and the title on sheet and the five sheets or views that they created that don't have a title on sheet and say, how much really you couldn't copy and paste that same text and change the number one to a number two? People get embarrassed and realize, wow, that was bad of me. Like, that was really my ownership. That was my integrity. That was my BIM not integrity. Right? And people generally self correct. I don't want to be out of integrity, you know, so we kind of point those things out. We had a question in the back, Troy, so we'll get to you in just a second. It looks like you have a lot in your templates. Do you recreate or do you update? Templates? That's a great question. So the question was, um, and I, we're repeating this, right? We're uh, digital, so I don't know if they've. They heard this. So the question was, do we update the template or do we recreate? We recreate every year or else you will blow your templates up. You will lose functionality if you update your files from one version to another. Almost every year I've found some things go away outright. This year I um, had a building. I always test. Right? The transfer procedures every year. First thing I do, get the new software. Okay, let's take this building. And I have a building with basically one example of every kind of thing in there. So there's one wall that's a mass that the walls are um, generated off a of mass. When I upgraded that template, those uh, curtain systems by face disappeared. Poof. Which is awesome. Has anybody ever had a whole entire curtain system disappear on them? So much fun. Hey, Jay, where'd the curtain wall go? No. God, please don't say those. Really? Yeah, it went away. Let's rebuild. Yeah, so that actually happened. So, um, no, the, and I, I actually have to talk to the developers this year. I, have, I talk to them every year about this. Technically, again, I haven't checked for 2013. Technically, though, every one of your tags should be rebuilt from scratch. I know how, much, how painful that sounds. But that is the tech. They, they're they working on the programming under the hood. They're cha they've been changing it from whatever the old style of programming was from the 1830s. When, you know, I mean, 1990s. What kind of programming was that? It's <laughs> not near what they're using now. So they've been changing it. And as they change these things, stuff breaks. So yes, the, to answer your question in a really long way, I don't upgrade the templates. I recreate it. The, the programmers will tell you We'll tell you, though, that there's nothing different from you upgrading your template for them upgrading. Yes, I don't. Uh, well, that's that's okay, awesome. Yeah, that's that's awesome for them to tell me that. I also had those developers say you can't build an ellipse in reality. So I don't really trust what they have to say because they work for a large company and they have to follow a policy line. So yes, at a certain level, hey, they might crashed. be upgrading. Uh, crash to do that. What's that? You're out of the hangout. Here's my question and a comment for you. Comment first. Okay. Your first floor and second floors use the same sheet number, so I think you have a typo. Oh, is that where it is? Thank you. <laughs> I've been looking for that, and I said somebody no, go down, Troy go back down to RCP. Troy wins the prize. Go back down to your RCP for second floor. Just kill that. We'll have to restart it. Go down. See, second floor RCP twelve eleven is the same. As and the first on floor, first floor, that's what it is. So it's the RCPs. Cool. Can you like? Message that to me. Sure. <laughs> so here's here's my question Thank though. You. How are you handling more than nine floors with your program? Now with this um, Navy convention. So you have a whole separate one for more floors. The uh, that first number about um, that one right there. Yeah, I don't want. Yeah, we could add another digit. Absolutely, I don't want to add another digit. Unless I do, we can. Let's have a five minute discussion. We add another digit, or if you don't want to add another digit. 
that does not become the level any longer. That is just a number. And the last two are just a sequential number. But that's one way. The other way is to add another. Keep talking. Oh, are you going to fix that? So are there any other questions? Everybody have their own custom browser organization? Or <laughs> Couple, few, everybody just using linear lists. Is that what's going on? Just list of views. My type. Yeah. All. <laughs> all just all. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, name you, money money. If you can filter the uh, schedules for me. Naming convention. Well, uh -huh. actually make them go away. Sort of pluses. I'll uh, show you. I'll I show you mine. Name, no, I use naming convention. Yeah. Right, right now, it's a Dave's. Today it's naming convention. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Today it's naming convention, and outside of that, Troy will show you his if you show him yours. Exactly. <laughs> God, I'll show you. Are we back in? Yeah, it's going to be about yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I think I need a couple more breaks before that. Yeah. Well, that's fine. Or show It's open. Well, you're going to get to you. Uh... Are you done? I am done. So I thank you guys very much for your time. And um, again, if uh, let me go to the last slide. So yeah, I lied to you about being done. Jay, where do you where do you uh, do your demo plans? In that list. Up front. Demolition of exist uh, demolition in existing would be up in the so A one point. Yeah, one of those numbers has to do with demolition. They would be in there. We do. And if I didn't, and if I didn't have it uh, spelled out in there, it's because that was built, and we haven't didn't do a demolition up to that point. So I just didn't include it. Like I said, there's always room for more, you know, growth. But uh, yeah, demolition should be the one point or the one something. So. Well, where are the PDF? That, thank you very much. That's a a good thing. So if if basically the note you want to put is you can just uh, search Los Angeles Revit Users Group blog on your favorite internet search, right? Because we're not supposed to say just Google it. So go Google Los Angeles Revit User Group blog or LA Rug blog. Uh, if you do LA Rug blog, you'll get Los Angeles Rug Company first. But we're right below that. So I mean, that's, you know, I mean, we're second. What can we do? They, they're actual company, so. Hopefully, we're sending a lot of traffic to them, and maybe they've made a sale. That would be awesome to go in there one day and find that out. But also, if you uh, search for CAD v. BIM, if you search for CAD v. BIM, you'll get my other blog. I actually write three of them. There's another one, Revit Fact Check, which is a, um, a place where if you don't like dirty words and very acidic, vitriolic banter, don't go there. It is a place where people lie about things in Revit and BIM, and we take it upon ourselves to set those lies straight. There's some guy out there on Twitter, or I haven't seen him in a long time, called Revit Facts. Went, he's an ARCHICAD user, went to the ARCHICAD things, started, went to this Arch, uh, Revit hate site. Yes, they exist. <laughs> By the way, you know you're geeky when whatever kind of geeky stuff you're into, there's a hate site about it. <laughs> and they're serious. Well, he posted all these 50 or so odd things as if they were read at facts. They were untrue, so I went one by one, and I use every dirty, nasty word, personally calling this person out. He disappeared off of, Reddit, or off of uh, Twitter after that. So, uh, yes, Revit Fact Check does check people's facts. And um, sometimes they're dirty words. So, please, children, anybody, offense, don't be offended. So, any one of those places. But the LA Revit User Group blog is, um, is it up here? And you see over here, by the way, you can watch this live right now. So, if you want. But right there are the, uh, the handouts. So, you just click on those. It should download them for you automatically, and uh, you'll get the, the PDF that I just showed with the. And if you want to show people your company or people that you know that are interested, all of these are being recorded on YouTube. This is our third one, so LA, Orange County, and now this one. So send them to those YouTube sites. 
Are we watching it live now? You are, you are watching it live now, yes. Thank you. And so the question was, aren't we watching it live now? The answer is yes, we are watching it live. Uh, tomorrow morning, this link will be cut. Well, actually, right after this, this link will become the link to the recorded session. And then tomorrow morning, that will be adjusted because I'm going to go and edit out Marcelo's portion for him. And um, But it will still remain a live link to the recorded session. So thank you guys very much. And next up is Troy Gates. Excuse me. All right, so Jay's presentation versus my presentation will be very different. Sorry, I'm getting the, the screen here so you can see me. Um, his was obviously very um, slideshow driven. Okay, um, Mine's on schedules, so in order to really show you how schedules, the things that I'm going to show you, I'm going to be sitting down most of the time running Revit, so they're a little bit different. So in all actuality, I only have one slide besides this one, so I hate PowerPoint. Um, so I'm doing schedules, and it's called Beyond Creation. So schedules are very simple. You pick a category, you pick a few parameters, you hit OK, you have a schedule. Great. Well, I'm going to take you beyond that and show you how to first show, show you how to do some appearance things to make it look better, um, not what you can do out of the box, but kind of some tricks that you can do. Jay hates the word tricks and tips, so I'm just calling it tricks, appearance tricks. Um, oh, by the way. Um, there's me. I'm with Mazzetti National T. Birch. We're an MEP firm. Um, we're all over the country. So here's what I'm going to talk about. So some appearance tricks. I'll cover each of those. And depending on how much time, I'll definitely cover key schedules. I might just touch these really quick. Again, they're in the handout, so you can go in and, and look at those afterwards if you want. Uh, but the, the top ones are, are the main ones I want to do really fast because these are things that a lot of people don't know that you can do. Okay. So symbols. Um, what I call a new line in the header text, custom titles, uh, view templates, and copy paste. So that's it for the slideshow. I learned that in business school, by the way. All right, so, and I guess it looks all right. So, first off, I'm going to do some stuff with schedules, and I just want to address here real quick. Oops, not sheets, schedules. Um, how I sort my schedules for, for Nick real quick. So uh, we use naming conventions. G means general. Uh, since we're MEP, we do multiple disciplines in one model. So G is anything that is company-wide, no matter what discipline you're in. Um, so that's what all the Gs are. The dots put them up higher than everything, so we put dots at the beginning of them. Um, B is for BIM management. Um, this model actually, usually I have a ton in there, but I, I try to trim them out of our models until I need them. Um, EW is electrical, and you can see things that are in capitals like J does go on sheets. Things that aren't in caps don't go on sheets. Uh, M for mechanical, P for plumbing, um, Q is for equipment planning. So that's how we do it. We separate them out. We do multiple letters to kind of put them together. Okay. So. To go through this here, I'm going to keep jumping back and forth because I want to make sure I go through this in the right order. So symbols. How do you get symbols into your schedule? So I, I get this question the last two times we did this is, oh, that means I can put a family in my schedule. Well, no, you can't put a family symbol in your schedule, but you can put other kinds of symbols. And I'll show you real quick how to do that. And actually, I went back and rethought about putting families in schedules. And I'll show you a quick way that you can fake families into your schedules. Okay. Which a lot of this, what I'm doing, is actually faking things. Um, but Revit allows you to do it. So I am just going to do, um, it doesn't really matter. So actually, I don't want to show that one first. Um, I'm going to go into my door schedule. And I don't have doors. Let's not do door schedules. Let's do rooms. I have rooms, sorry. Uh, so I'm just going to do a quick room schedule. And I'm just going to add in some quick. Things here, uh, name, number, and I'm just going to add a parameter. I'm just going to call this uh, delta. Okay, with this caps. All right. So the main thing on this is the type of parameter it needs to be is text. You can only put these symbols in text because they're actual text characters that are symbols. 
So that's the way, the main one is that the type of parameters we text. Doesn't matter what you group it in, um, discipline, common, or discipline, uh, you can choose any of them, doesn't matter. But text parameter is the main one. So I'll put that there. I'll actually get rid of area here. So here's a quick room schedule. Okay. And here's that delta schedule that I just created. Okay. This is a project parameter, so it only exists in this project, but every single room I put in automatically gets that parameter. Okay. So if you didn't know what project parameters are, that's really all they are. So I want to put something in here. So in Windows, if I come over here to Windows, um, and because I've opened it so many times, it's showing here. But what you can do is in here, you can start typing character, and it comes up with one called character map. And this is built into every version of Windows. And what it is, is it shows you for a certain font, every single character that's embedded in that font file. And so you can see here's the alphabet, but then it goes beyond that. For instance, if you want to put a copyright symbol in your, in your schedule, you could. Um, if you wanted to put a plus or minus in there, you could. But I'm going to jump down here to one that actually looks like a delta symbol, uh, which is down here. So first, before I select it, one thing to note is the font here has to be the same font that you use in your project for your schedules. If I pick like Times New Roman and I picked one and pasted it in, it's going to look totally different than what I thought it was because my schedules here are done in Arial. So the symbols I pick have to be in the Arial font. Okay? So I want this symbol here. Actually, let me uh, pick the one next to it here. I want this symbol here to show up in my schedule. So I just click on it, select, copy, come in here to the one I want it, and then using the keyboard, Control V is paste. And now I have that symbol in my schedule. Okay? And you can just keep doing this for any symbols you want. You want a smiley face in there? Get rid of that one. Select it. Copy it. And we want a smiley face in the restroom. So we come in, paste it. Now I have a smiley face. Okay? So just so you can see them on the, on the sheets here, let me do a quick sheet. And now I'm going to drag that. It was a room schedule. Put it on there. You can see they're actually in the schedule there. So that's a quick way to get symbols in your schedule. Okay? Um, and within my firm, we use this a lot. Uh, when we do a revision schedule, we'll have a different parameter for every single revision. We'll go in and put solid dots on the sheets that are part of that revision. So it graphically shows you with those dots which ones are part of that package. Okay? So you can get creative and do all kinds of symbols. So. One of the questions that came up in one of the previous ones was, what if I really want that family symbol in there? So I'm going to show you that one in a couple of tricks here, um, how you can do that. And I, I don't want to spoil one of the other tricks on how I'm actually going to do that. So I'll include it on there. So, so there you go. That's how quick and fast you can do it, character maps. Okay. So moving on to the next one is how to get um, a new line in the header. So I'm going to come over here to one of my um, I keep clicking sheets on one of my schedules. So I've got a schedule here for air handlers, okay. And so when I'm talking about new line is, for instance, right here with service, you can see that it's on a first line. This one for supply and CFM is on two different lines. Well, in in Revit by default, um, if you stretch it out. Let me get rid of my little tree here so you can see it. So that's what it would actually look like, okay? Because it's stretched out, right? And then I would have to keep stretching this in until it finally wraps. Well, I want to put in that new line on my own because I want this to be as wide as I want it to be. So the key in here is where you want to start the new line, you hold down Shift and then hit Enter. And that puts in a whole new line and tricks Revit into giving you a new line. So you do Shift and Enter. You can see it now moves it down. I hit enter again, and now I can make this as big as I want, and it's not going to move that CFM back up to the top. So shift enter allows you to do a new line. And this actually works outside of schedules. It works in any parameter field that is text. So if you have, for instance, say you have a tag and the line or the text in it is too long, go into the parameter field, click where you want, hit shift enter. You won't be able to see it anymore in the parameter box, but it's, that text is still there. Uh, there's certain things that doesn't work in, like uh, sheet names. Sheet names will not work in. The names of views it will not work in either. Yeah, anything that Revit has to parse for a specific object, but any parameter that's just a normal parameter, it will. Room work. names, I believe it works if you type it in the room name, but not type in it from the object. There's 
one of the areas in the room is the president. Correct. Yeah, so, so the comment was that it works in the room name, but you have to put it in the right parameter for the room name for it to work. And that's yes. correct. Okay. So again, that's just a real quick tip. It's something that if you didn't know about it, now you do, so now you can make the schedules look a little bit better than you want. Okay. So now moving on to the next one, uh, which is custom titles. Okay. So right now you can see I don't have a title on here. The title would actually be either the name of the schedule or um, if I turn it on, I could go in here and you know click in here and type. But look, where's my title? Oh, it's, it's way over here, center justify. And I can type something new in there. I, I don't really like that, and I don't like the way it looks. So for instance, if I put this out onto a sheet, okay, and that was my... Air handler. So if I put this out on a sheet, for us, we don't like the way this looks within my company. We like it to be a little bit better. For one thing, we like it to be left justified. Uh, we might want a different font. We might want to include a symbol in there, whatever. So the way to create a custom title here is to go in and turn off the title, which is the way I did it here on the appearance. I just went in and said, don't show title. The other thing that I always do, too, is get rid of the blank row before data. And what that does is you would have all of these, and then you would have a gap, and then you would actually have your data. Well, that kind of messes up how the flow of this works, so I uncheck that also. So these two things are the important ones to uncheck. So then when I put this back on, this, on the sheet, you can see that um, the title is gone, but my schedule is still there. And then what I do is I actually create a detail group. And you can see I, I named these very similar to how we name our schedules, because again, you can't filter these. So E is electrical, M is mechanical. And in this case, this is for a schedule. So what this detail group does, if I drag it in and place it, you can see it gives me my own custom title for this schedule. And all this group is, is if I edit that group, it's just line work and text. And then I group all that together, name it based on the schedule. And then um, one nice little trick is to move the, the start point. You can actually snap to the corner of a schedule. So when I put that origin there, you, oh, I don't want to move it. I want to move this from that origin point. If I can grab it here. So I'm going to say move. I'm going to go from the origin point. You can see you can snap to that top corner of your schedule. So it actually lines up perfectly. And then you can see the line work. We made it the right link. So you can do things like put a symbol in here, for instance, for our keynotes. We like to have the circle denoting that the circle is a keynote. So we like to put the circle in here to denote that's the symbol for it. I could do the same thing. And this is how did you get the other end of the lineup on the right hand side? Okay. So when I made the schedule, I put the schedule on first. So I put the schedule on first and then I drew the group to match it. And that's in our template. But let's say somebody did come in here and say, well, this remarks isn't long enough, right? Well, all I gotta do now is come in here and edit the group. And then I uh, just like that line move, and again it will snap, oh, okay. and then just finish it, and there you go. So it's, I mean, you could do it without the group. It could just be line work text, but then you would have to draw that every time. Right. By making it a group, I just drag it in, snap it, and done. Well, and also, I mean, you know, if you're not sold on having the lines around the thing, don't need the lines, or you can ultimately make it as another kind of, you know, detail component that can stretch. Now, there's all sorts of different ways. Yeah, you can make it a detail one, sure. But then every time you needed to edit it, you would have to go to the family editor to edit it. Whereas a group, I can just edit it, and groups purge. So, you know, at the end of the project purge, all those ones that I didn't use are gone, right? So, and this is where the question came up, well, what if I wanted custom family symbols in here? Same way. I can go in here and edit this group, and now I can start putting detail families in here that represent what the original family looked like. And I can just line them up based on the rows of the objects in there, save that group, and now I have a column in the front that has the symbols. And so you can be a little bit creative here and make your schedules look better. It obviously is not live, so if I add a new row in there, it might adjust it, so I'd have to go back and adjust it. But for like an air handling schedule, the symbols are all going to be the same, so I don't really care, right? Okay? Or let's say you wanted a circle around the mark number. I could go in and add those circles on the mark numbers. And then when I add another one, it doesn't matter because all the, the rows are the same height. So I would just add another circle at the bottom. Easy deal. Okay. So that's that trick. Um, again, 
it's not hugely important to your project, but it makes it look a little bit better. It makes it look more like your company standards if you want to. All right, so the last two actually aren't really tricks. I think they're just things that a lot of people didn't know you could do in Revit. The first one is your schedules, and Jay didn't really cover them that much, but your schedules can have view templates. So when you get your schedule looking the way you want it in the appearance tab, this is the only thing it affects is the appearance here. But when you get it looking the way you want, don't go back and recreate that and, and do what I used to do, which was take a screenshot of that, put it over on the other monitor, <laughs> go to each schedule and change it to look the same. Just create a view template for it. And then you can assign it to it. So you can edit it here. You can edit it. And then I can come back later and just assign it to all of my schedules so all of my schedules look the same. Maybe different schedules look differently. Create different view templates for different looks. Okay? Does that work to make... Um, schedule dependent on the view template, like it does for other views. For 13? Uh, I don't know if it does or not. I haven't, I'm, we're not using 13 yet, so I, I haven't really looked into it. Obviously, I'm using 13 here for the demo, but uh, I don't know if it auto updates. So, so there it is. If I go in and edit the template now, it's already grayed out. Look. Is it grayed out? Yes. Yeah. It is grayed out. So, yeah, so it auto updates it. So there you go. Yeah. So you can set it once and not have to do it again. Okay. So for those of you that didn't know, so in, in 2013, and Jay touched a little bit, if you apply a view template to a view, all of the ob all of the things that you've set up in the view template don't change. All right. There you go. She's going to explain them more. Yeah, you can set it based on how you have know, set it set up. Where you want Correct. And you just copy the schedule Correct. Okay. So, so moving on here, I'm trying to move quick so, so Lisa has time to do hers. So the last thing I just wanted to do, and again, this is just something I don't think people really knew, is that you can copy and paste schedules from one project to another. So all you have to do is right click on the schedule. There's a copy to clipboard in there. I can go to another project. So I'll go to the different project here. Doesn't matter where you're in, actually, it does matter. You can't be in a schedule. So I have to be in a floor plan. And same thing, control V. Paste it in. You're going to get the typical poche error, which has been around since Revit 1. Drop it onto a sheet. There it is. You can do it on the sheet. No, can you drop that onto a sheet real quick? Sure. Are the information would be different. Yeah, clearly so, the information is different. But what I'm there you go. So it's the same exact size. It's the same exact size. Everything is exactly the same. This is the distinction between. Uh, oh yeah. Get in front of the camera. And also, uh, so this is the distinction between um, inserting that schedule from another project and actually copying and pasting it. Uh, whereas if you copy, whether it's from the project browser or from your sheet, just copy. Take that schedule, hit copy. Go to a sheet and the other project and hit paste. What this does is it keeps the formatting. And if anybody is particular about how their schedules are formatted, that's a big important distinction to make. So copying into the clipboard to bring it into other projects that may not have it is a really fantastic workflow and it keeps this level of consistency. Nobody has to resize anything. It's how the company wanted it. So oh, not on the video. Can you have a file on that? No, so I would copy that group over also. What does that say? It's because I applied that view template to it, which turned it on because it was a <coughs> view template. Our, our working schedule view template turns on everything so you can work with it, and then we disassociate it so it goes back to the way it works. Yeah. Uh, this one actually only had one view template, but our, our template actually has multiple view templates for each kind of schedule. Uh, yeah, this one is it. Uh, and the one question or comment that was made was that it didn't bring all the objects in. So if I had five air handlers in my project and I have zero in here, I'm not going to have those five air handlers show up in the, in the schedule. It's going to be empty. Okay. So actually, let me let me do it the other way. So I have this room schedule, right? And there's rooms in here. So if I copy this, I'm not copying the rooms with it. Okay. So if I come here and I'll just jump down to here. So if I paste in here, okay. See, the rooms didn't come with it. Because the rooms are the objects that the schedule is reporting about is what's in that project. But the nice thing it did do is if I go over here to this one, all of these 
are project parameters. All those project parameters come with it. So if you come up here and look at our project parameters, all of these are our project parameters. All of those automatically get created. So if you have a template file and you have, say, an old project that's of the same Revit version and you don't have all those project parameters in there, don't go recreate them all. Copy and paste the schedule that has them, and they will all automatically get populated for you. They'll go to the right object category, and they'll go to the to all the same groups and everything. So it's a very fast way to get project parameters from one to the other for a select few. Because if you do the transfer project standards, it's going to do every single project parameter. Right? This allows you to copy just a few over. Okay. And why do I do it that way? Somebody asked last time. Well, unfortunately, mechanical equipment is one category, and I have so many different kinds of mechanical equipment, I have to break it out somehow for schedules. So AHU stands for the air handling unit. Otherwise, uh, for instance, fan motor. I have fan motors on so many different things, it's going it's to go into our schedule wrong because we have so many different things under one category. It's something that we're hoping eventually in Revit MEP they actually break down mechanical equipment into multiple categories, like structure has and stuff. But and what you do. Okay? So that's kind of my appearance tricks or kind of things that you can do. Again, it doesn't really change your project other than, you know, letting you do a little bit more than you can do by from out of the box. All right. So the main one of the main things I wanted to do was cover um, key schedules because key schedules again are something that not a lot of people really know how to use. Um, in fact, a lot of people don't even know they're available because in order to get a key schedule, all it is is one button to create a key schedule that's kind of hidden or not really apparent. So what a key schedule is, is it's a lookup schedule or a what I term as a freeform schedule. So to create a, a new key schedule, if you go in and you go to schedule and quantities, okay, everybody knows how to do this, so I go to room um, and I create a new schedule. Well, there's one little button here between scheduled building components and scheduled keys. And that's the only difference between the two. I'll explain the actual difference, but that's the difference in how to create the two. So this one would do normally how you want. I would have a schedule of rooms. It would go out, look at the parameters that I give it, and pull that data in automatically. Schedule keys actually allow me to create my own parameters that have my data in them that aren't tied to objects yet or aren't tied to objects until I tell it to. Okay, so I'm just going to go through, and I'm not going to create one. Uh, I'm going to show you some that are already created, but that's the difference. You hit schedule keys and hit OK, and you'd want this has to be a unique name in here. So kind of name it based off of what that's going to be, and I'll, I'll show you how I have it here. So in these schedules right here, I have two sets of schedules: one for the CVC plumbing code and one for the CPC plumbing code, and this is for getting fixtures based on occupancy. Okay. And so I have a lookup for a key schedule in here for the load factor. And all this, all this is, so again, if I come in here and I'll edit it, I picked key schedule for rooms because I'm basing it on occupancy. So room is what the, is going to look up the data that's in this key schedule. So I went in, and the key name is the one that it gives you by default. Well, what did I name, name that key name? I named it CBC load factor. Because okay, that's really what this lookup table is, is giving me is a load factor based on area. Okay? And then I created my own um, parameters in here just by hitting add parameter, naming it what I wanted, the type of parameter, etc. So if I go in and just edit one of these, um, you can see it's based on rooms because I created it in the room schedule. And here's the name of my parameter. And in this case, I put it under plumbing. So when you look at the actual room object, this would fall under the grouping, like where it says other here, it would say plumbing, and that would be in there under that grouping. Okay? So that's all these are. Some of them um, I do as calculated values, but not in the key schedule. I'll show you calculated values in the regular schedule that use these. So I went to the code book. I said, all right, give me the group types. I typed them all in. And then I put in the, the type of group, the load factor, and usability notes, which is something I can come look at and say, OK, <coughs> the code says I need 30 square feet per occupant. That's what the code is. Okay. So how do you get these? Pretty much all you do is hit new. And click in here. And it gives me a new row. And then I type whatever I want. So if I had an assembly 3, I would just do A-3. 
that I come over here, type this, type this, type this. And this isn't tied to any objects yet. Okay, this is free form stored in Revit on its own in, in a in an area that you can't get to except for in the schedule. And then the way you use this is I go back here to. Okay, I name it a little bit different than Jay was. He put management at the beginning. I put management at the end. This was a long time ago when I created these. Um, but this management one is. I'm leaving. Sorry, different companies do different things, right? So what this management one is, is it's a regular room schedule. So if I went in here and went to the fields, you can see available fields from room. So I created a new room schedule. It's telling me the room number, the name of the room, et cetera, right? All of these here, okay? These three are built in, number, name, area, okay? Those are built into Revit. I added all of these, okay? The ones that say none, are the key names in the key schedules. So in this one, the CBC group type is actually from this load factor group type, okay? So the way I can tell is if I click in there, you can see there's all the values that I pre-formatted, okay? And there's even that A3 that I added temporarily, okay? So all of these are the same as these because that's the same parameter. Actually, I want to delete this one, okay? So, what it's going to do is it's going to say, okay, if I pick A1, take all of these and put them in the same parameters in my room schedule. So when I come to the room schedule and I pick A1, you can see it automatically put in the load factor and it automatically put in the group of assembly. Again, same thing that it's pulling from here and here and here. Okay? And the way you do that in here is when I go to add my fields, the ones that I put in my key schedule or my schedule key, I always say it backwards, the schedule key, are available to me in this list now and I can add them to my scheduled fields. So all the ones I create in my schedule key, I also now have in my room schedule. And what it does is when I pick the group type or the key, it automatically fills those in. So if I come in here and pick um, B, you can see it automatically fills those in. Okay, I'll show you in a second what it fills in. <laughs> But that's all this is doing, is it's going out, looking that up, automatically grabbing the values and putting them in my schedule. So think of a door schedule, just a second. So think of a door schedule that has your hardware, okay? You could have all of your hardware as a schedule key. So when you say this is door hardware type one, it will go in and grab all that data and stick it into that door schedule for that one door, okay? I do that for 100 doors, and let's say I have five different types of, of um, hardware in that hardware schedule. Well, I go back and I edit that schedule key. All of those ones that had that automatically update, okay? So for instance, here, this 200 square foot, if I go in here and edit that, and I say this is, you know, even though I'm changing the code, I go in here now, and you can see it automatically changed on both of them. That's how quickly and powerful you can change your schedule without going through every single one in your schedule and change it by hand, okay? So that's really the power of this is it is locked into that schedule key, so it's all automated now. So you don't have, like I said, if you had 100 doors, you don't have to go through every single door and make sure that you change it correctly. Question or comment? Well, the comment was, right, changing something one time and it pushes out multiple times. So like Troy said, you know, change that key schedule once and it pushes out to maybe hundreds of different kind of views or locations and objects. Severely powerful. But again, it gets down to building and working with integrity. Little tip to take. This will be a tip and trick. There you go. If you do something more than three times in a row, and you have to continue to do that, and you have to start clicking and redoing things over and over, you now have no excuse to keep doing that. You have a better way than when I finish. If you start doing something and you find yourself repeating it, repeating it, take your hand off your mouse, move back at least two feet. I like to move back about three and a half. And I do this. Say, what can I be doing better? Because there is a better way. There's a more efficient way. So if you see people typing in the same about 100 square feet, 100 square feet, 100 square feet into a schedule, you now know a better way where you can do something one time and push it out 100 times as opposed to doing one thing 100 times over and over. 
Um, very, very slight distinction, but you're going to be able to go home at 5.30 on Friday night. The other team are going to be there for one morning. So. Okay. So another thing I wanted to show real quick was how I'm coming up with the occupant number here. So what this is is it's just a calculated field that is based on um, and there's my load factor. So it's based on taking the area which is built into every room and dividing by that load factor that I'm pulling out of my schedule key. So by doing that little bit of math, it's automatically filling in what the occupants are. So that's the whole purpose of this is I don't want to sit down with a calculator and for every room figure out how many occupants are in those rooms per code. Okay? And it's different. CVC and CVC have different code. So if you look in here, okay, I have a whole different list. And so if I pick that, you can see it's seven square feet, where the other one is 30 square feet. So different code, you know, you're going to have different schedules. And so that occupant number is a lot different than that occupant number. I don't want to have to figure those out on my own. Let Revit do that for you. That's the power, that's the eye, right, in, in BIM, is getting that information in there. So just to kind of move it along quickly here, so I have other things. Well, let me just show you. These are This is a calculated value also. So let's say I needed so many fixed seats in there. It would automatically add this and that to get that. And then, um, so based on water closets, this number I need to look up and fill in more information. So I have another schedule C for each one of these columns that says none. That's how you can tell it's looking for a schedule key is it says none. So in this case, for the water closets for mail, I have a water closet mail here. Again, straight out of the code book, I created a line for each bit of code. So for the auditoriums or assembly, these are the code per how many occupants. So in the case of this, there's 93.9 occupants. So I can quickly come in here and say this is A1. 93 is between 76 and 125. That's the code for the, the male water closets. It automatically figured out how many water closets I need for that volume of people or that occupancy. Okay, So getting this kind of stuff built in once, everybody that works in your company would never have to figure this out again. They just go in and pick the appropriate things. It automatically calculates it for you. Okay, So that's really all, all these schedule keys are doing in, in this case. Um, like I said, you can get tons of different things, door schedules. How many people have to go in right now and type in individually what your detail numbers are for your jam, your, sorry. So all those details, right? You have them in your door schedule. You have to go type those in for what sheet they're on and what detail number and everything. Put them in a schedule key. Go in and pick that door is on this one, boom, it fills it in for you. Next door, pick it, it fills it in for you, okay? So there's a ton of information about how you can do this. So I'm going to quickly jump to the other two areas just real quick. This is all in the handout. You can go look it up. Okay. So the other two things I'm, I'm just going to show you how to get to them. One is um, doing, um, sorry, let me pull out PowerPoint make sure I get in the right order. One is doing conditional formatting and the other is doing embedded schedules. All conditional formatting does is it allows you to go in and highlight for room spaces and a few other um, categories highlight an object based off of a rule. And the way that you can tell that you have it is if you go into formatting in a schedule, there's a button here called conditional format. You can click on that. Um, you can go in and pick the field that you want to do. So for instance, in this case, I would do um, based off the number. If the number is equal to one, make that red. And it will go in and you can see here in the schedule, it automatically makes that red. So. Use your mind, get it, get crazy. You can make these schedules highlight things based on those conditions. And the last one is doing what's called an embedded schedule. Again, these are for rooms and spaces. Actually, conditional formatting is for anything. I misspoke. Embedded schedules are for rooms and spaces mostly, but for a few other things. This is one that I created real quick that is a room furniture schedule. It allows me to take every room and find all the furniture objects in that room and put it in the same schedule. And the way that you do it is when you do a room or space and a few other ones, you get a new button called Embedded Schedules. When you click on that, you can turn it on. You can tell it what category you want. In this case, I did furniture. And then I can come in and pick the parameters, just like I'm doing a new furniture schedule. 
and now it associates if that piece of furniture is found in that room and then I also did count and there's 25 of them and so I'm gonna go in here real quick and just show you what it's doing let me open up the floor plan here and tile these what it's doing is it's, it's actually looking at the room object here and if these pieces of furniture fall within the outline of that room it will report it in here so if I go in here um, and I delete this one you can see that number automatically changes so if it's within that room boundary you can schedule those and you can make this schedule look any way you want make it look nice question comments so, um What's the limit of what you can schedule in that room? Is it only on the is it based based on what's on the floor or what's touching the floor? Or I believe it has to be on the same level as the room level. So the question is what what's in it? Or reference to that level? So every object has to have a level that it's created on. Okay. That level has to match the room's level. Okay. So you can create furniture, you can create other object yeah. references to Yeah, I don't believe, for instance, like if you had say a light fixture that was on the second floor and it was hung down onto the first floor yeah. room if it would pick it up. I don't yeah. I don't think so. I was wondering about other yeah. objects and facilities management are bus and what they're doing. I believe it's based on the origin of the family. Okay. So if the origin if I drew this desk but the origin of the family was outside the building, mm -hmm. it wouldn't read as being inside of this well, but that part of the other yeah. things. But it's a piece of family within that yeah, as long as it's within this room here. Right. Like if, if I was to take one of these and put it partially, right. if it will stop snapping here. Right. Okay. So that one's out of it now. Well, I'm looking somewhere like all your metrics, you know, there's one, you know, you're in any case, you know, they were in space or, you know. And it has to be fully contained because you can see it's 23, now it's 24. So it has to be fully contained within the room. Okay. What if it's two feet off the ground? It doesn't matter. Yeah. Like I said, as long as as long as the host level is the same. Is it based on the host level, or is it based on where the level is kind of calculating the volume? I believe it's the same. I, I believe the room and the object have to have the same host level. That's what I was asking. Yeah. If it's base based or ceiling hosted, or, you know, well, even if it's ceiling hosted, it's still based on that level. Yeah, Every object is based on a level. That's what I was asking. Because yeah. that's, that's why if you delete a level, right, all the objects on that level get delete it because they, they can't stand in space. They have to be on a level. Yeah. Okay. So you can do a ton of things. Um, just the last thing I want to leave you on is if you look at the different categories in here, there are a lot of categories. Okay. Furniture, plumbing fixtures, lighting fixtures, um, even parking. I mean, you can do a ton of stuff to find out where they're at. Okay. Room spaces, I believe zones, and a few other categories. If you see this, tab on it, that means you can do it. If you don't see the tab, then you can't do it. Okay. Oh, so this is before 2013, only an MEP. In 2013, everybody gets it if you use Revit one box, which is all the disciplines combined. If you only use architecture 2013, it's not in there. So you have to have the combined product suite of all the disciplines. The embedded schedules. So it's only in there because MEP is in one box. If you turn it off, it'll go away. If I turn off. If you go to the options and turn off systems, it'll go away. So what what Elisa is saying here too is that if you go in here to I don't even know what it's under user interface. If you go in and turn off systems, any of them or just all of them? Well there's three systems, but Maybe because oh, I already sorry. knew it. Maybe no, it'll go. Wait. No, it'll go. Yeah, yeah. Sure everybody knows too that the Revit one box is only available in the Blue Design Suite Premium and the Ultimate, and it's not a single product. Can can't students get it though alone, or do they get the whole building suite? They could. Yeah, so I I think students can get the one box by itself. That's cool. Yeah. Okay. So I'm out of time. Thank you, uh, Lisa. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is um, Elisa de Dios. I am BIM manager, uh, associate at AC Martin Partners. It's an architectural firm in downtown LA. 
um, new architecture and planning interior architecture. I'm going to go pretty fast because we're kind of really late. Um, mine is strictly PowerPoint, and also the handout is a lot more detailed than what I'm going to be showing here. So if you go, down, go and download it. So. So what I'm going to be talking about is model management and settings. And to talk about model management, model management first, I'm going to get into warnings, model cleanup, and work sharing models. Let's say what I'm talking about is basically what typically a BIM manager does or the BIM lead on a project to clean up to keep the, the file, the model, um, efficient, but things that I think everybody should know, it's not so much that you're going to be doing it all the time, but it's things you need to know, you need to understand that should be happening. You may not be the person tasked to do it. So to start off with warnings, is all of the warnings here are typically um, things you need to clean up, things that shouldn't be showing up. All of this has a fix. None of these warnings here should exist there. One way to see them is you go to the Manage tab, and you go to Warnings, and then you see the, the this. I'm blanking out, sorry. You see the dialog. Another way to see is if you select one of the warnings, you click Show. It'll take you. It give you a, a pop up that will then tell you, okay, do you, are you sure you want to open the view? And then it'll take you to different views in the model to find it. Another way, which I think is um, not easier, but everyone on the team can see that there are warnings associated. Is when you select an object, when you highlight it on the contextual tab, you're going to see something that says show related warnings. If there is a warning uh, attached or something going on with that project, in this example of the wall, there's actual root separation line which is hidden in the view, but that's the, the warning you see there. So once you select it, you can just click show warnings and the dialog will come up. The next I want to talk about is model cleanup. Um, delete views not being used. We have our, our own view setup, which is coordination, plot views, uh, sometimes presentation, working views. What I do is select views, change it to not on sheets, and whatever I see in there, I'm going to now delete. Typically, if I see something that says, you know, call out to, call out of, I know some of these, again, with the whole lowercase, uppercase, if there's uppercase text, I realize, okay, that's probably going to go on a sheet, so I won't delete it. But if I see anything with lowercase, somebody's name, something that just showed me, okay, this is just a copy of a copy of a copy, I'm just going to go in and clean it up. Another thing I do on our template is we actually have a view list that shows only the sheets that don't belong on that, oh, the sheets that are not on a the views that are not on the sheet, excuse me. So what I do is I get go create a view list, family view name and sheet number. Sheet number is important because that's what I'm going to filter out. In this particular project, we also we actually have sheets that start with 01, so I'm filtering out anything that's less than 01. I get a little um, angle, so I want to see the family as my header. I want to itemize every instance, obviously. And then I hide it because I want to see it. And in this case, my header is a family, and these are all the views. So this tells me, okay, I have a view named Elisa. If I don't use the family as a header, then I don't know what kind of view it is. So this way it's separated by the type of view it is, and I know I can see most of these out, what gets to be deleted, what gets to not be deleted. <laughs> Lastly, with cleaning up is um, purging, auditing, your file. One thing I do is I do it once a month or once a week, depending on the file size, depending on the team, depending on the project size. But I always set a schedule because if I don't have a schedule set on when I'm going to be doing this, it ain't going to happen. So the first thing is when I click open, select audit, you're going to get the warning. It's going to tell you, are you sure you want to do this? And it's going to be slow. With current hardware, I don't think it becomes that slow anymore, but the warning is always there. After I click Audit, I then Purge. And you see here that I have 234 items to clear. 
I do not actually go and see, okay, what do I want to keep? What don't I want to keep? I get rid of everything because the stuff that I may want to keep is like standard annotation, that kind of stuff. I can always load it from my library. So I really don't take the time to look at everything because it's kind of pointless to me. The last thing is with work shared models, you have the option of compacting it when you make a new central. It says slow, again, but typically it's not that slow unless your file is really messed up or really, really large. I you know some companies do have very large files, so you do get to slowness. But and typically what I've done with 200 megabyte files, 350, it takes maybe 15 minutes. Another thing I do with just model management within the file is working in, in WorkShare models. I have different work sets to keep everything organized, to keep everyone um, having open what they need, visible what needs to be seen. Typically, um, anything that has a link, add the link in front of it. Interiors, in this particular project, I have an outside office and our own interiors in our company working together. So the linked interiors, I don't turn it on because I don't need to see it. But it's in our office, I don't turn it on, only in the view that they need to be on. Another thing here is site work. I don't have it on because we do very little site work, but I do need to see it in a few views. So by default, I have it off so it doesn't have to take the time to think. Oops. One thing um, I don't, I do sometimes is say not opened. If you don't open the work set, it doesn't load in the information so your computer can work a little faster. So if you're working in an area where you really don't need to see the interiors or the site work or the mechanical, you only need to see the structural, you cannot load, you cannot open that work set and it won't load it in. So it makes it a little faster. Lastly, with settings, I'm talking about object styles line weights, and view templates. With object styles, the only thing I want to mention is this is standard default Revit. Typically, everything is one when it comes to projection. I'm not going to get into all the line weights as far as line styles and that kind of thing. But in this case, I always change this because line weight one is default for all the fill patterns. So if I want an outline of the fill pattern, if it's, like, if it's cutting through my wall, it looks very similar. So it's kind of not standing out for me. But then what I then do is open up the line weights um, dialog, see what's there, and not necessarily change it. I just need to see at the scale that I use, what is Revit using? So that I can go back and go back to object styles and change it to what I want. So this is what I have, and this is what Revit gives me. I always start with two. View templates, lastly, is this will show up what I, this is going to have everything I need to have in my sheet architectural plan. That way, when I have all my class sheets, I, I assign the template and what I need has to be there. I don't have everything on because I don't need to see everything. I'm only checking what's important to be on that, on that plot sheet. I just left it to the default of architectural plan, but I have floor plan and large plan, finished floor plan because they're all going to look slightly different. So in the view properties, I go to the view temp to the view template parameter, change it to my architectural plan, and now in 2013, which was with, um, similar to the schedules which Troy showed earlier, when somebody goes to change it, they can't change it because we have the problem sometimes where somebody's not in their working view, they're on the plot sheet and they want to change the course field or they want to change the scale really quick to do something, and then they don't change it back. And then when you are plotting, there's always the one sheet that's off and you have to go back and print. Now in 2013, as soon as you set the view template, that can be changed. And it gives people a warning that, okay, I'm not on the right view, let me go back to my working view. Is that a default if this happens? When you set the view template, yes. If the view template is set to none, it doesn't change. Okay. But it has to have that checkbox. Oh, that. yes. Okay. Exactly. That's the other yeah. thing. So because I had detail level checked, that's why detail level isn't accessible. So if you do, if that's something that you can change off and on, that you don't have to have that checked and then it'll be. So like in the, the case of what I have here, I don't have um, 
override imports. I don't have that check because I might need to see something from a cat file. I mean, not from depending on what um, view I'm in. So that I leave off because that's going to change per plot chain. Just one comment about that. So something that I've found in there is that the view scale, you're not always going to have all of your views the same scale. So create a different view template for each scale. And yeah. you can duplicate what you have and then lock the scale down because that's one of the things that people mess up a lot on sheets is they'll accidentally go in and change the scale. And then that whole sheet is, is wrong because all your annotations going to be overlapping or too small or, or whatever. Okay. Oh, I'm done. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Sorry, I went really fast, but we were kind of cut on time. Or questions in general? Yeah, any questions in general? Yeah. There you go. Okay. All right. So there was actually a comment in the back um, about the crop not cropped, not being able to be uh, chosen is one of those things. And that's actually a really good comment. And one of the things that I do to kind of manage that is not every view, but most views are associated to scope boxes. So this way, unless you change the scope box, you can't change the cropping of that view. And how I or, uh, deal with the uh, management of the scope boxes is they, they go into their either one or several, depending on the need of the project, um, work sets. That's by default off in every view. This way I can go hard coded on in my working view or my user view. In my case, I call them user views or I call them working. It's absolutely fine. Um, but I can go in and change the size of those if I need. So if you don't already use scope boxes, really look into that. It's awesome. You know, quite often I'll have one for the overall building, the overall site, and then different portions of the building, maybe quadrants, stair towers, elevator shaft, those kind of things. So that's a really good way to manage those things which kind of relate to that. And create a naming standard for them. Yes. So you know what they are. Yes, sir. Because in right. I copy yours. Yeah. I will copy them from your model and put them in mine so my views are exactly cropped to how your views are. And then another comment was about the uh, you, you know the fact that if in one model that's linked into other models, if you use the same exact, and I, when I say exact, I mean exact. I mean spaces, sentence case, all of that. If you use word sets that are the same exact name, they will correlate with one another. So that's a really powerful thing as well. So that kind of does it for tonight's presentation, unless there are any other questions. Um, uh, again, in the handout on those blog links and the Los Angeles Reddit User Group blog, you can find our Twitter names if you guys, any of you tweet or any of that. Um, you can find out, you can get in touch with us on the blog. There's an email address that goes and we can, you know, you can answer questions, anything like that. And, um, Outside of that, we thank you very much for your time. No, know it's a little bit late in the evening, but we hope it's worth it. And uh, thank you very much for having us, and we'll see you guys out in the Inland Empire next month.